All right. <clears throat> Today we're going to look at the vision of the harlot city, part one. We're going to focus on the marriage supper of the Lamb. But before I do, let me show you on the screen, I'll show you the outline, especially for those coming here today for the first time. We're in the middle of a huge sermon series on Revelation. You'll see my outline. Revelation starts with an introduction, ends with a conclusion, and there are seven main visions. Right now, we're in the home stretch. We're at vision number six, the vision of the harlot city. If you look up on the screen again, you'll see that the vision of the harlot city is, a, is the longest vision of all the visions. It goes from chapter 17 to 20. Huge. So we could, can't do that whole vision in one Sunday. So I'm going to break it up into two parts. Part one, we're going to see the, the judgment of the great prostitute. And there is some incredibly good news there that we'll see today. Uh, we'll see the marriage supper of the Lamb. And then next week, we'll look at the judgment of the beast, uh, I don't want to give away who the, they are just yet. Remember, uh, John is writing to Christians who are being persecuted. So the judgment is on those who are persecuting and murdering Christians, okay? So that's what this judgment scene is, is about. Now, on the next screen, you'll see the outline for the sermon and also the outline for part one. So this, what, this is going to focus on the judgment of the great prostitute. And um, there are three main visions within that. But the whole, it's all about the judgment of the pr prostitute. But there are three main visions. First, we're going to see the prostitute and the beast. Then, secondly, we're going to see the fall of the prostitute, which is the harlot city. And then the third vision is rejoicing over the judgment of the prostitute, but there's going to be rejoicing in heaven. And then uh, after we look at those three, what I'm going to do is I'm going to focus on the marriage supper of the Lamb. So that's what we're going to do. Look at this judgment of the great prostitute, those three visions. Then I'll look at the marriage supper of the Lamb. Then we're going to have a special communion service. So it's a special one just for this Sunday. We'll have it again next week as well, but this is going to be special. Uh, I, I hope and pray it'll be special. So let's pray for God's blessing. Lord, would you bless us? Would you fill us with your Holy Spirit to hear your word for us today? Um, and help us just even begin to grasp the incredible news of uh, the marriage supper of the Lamb. Uh, so bless us today, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, I should give you a, a caveat uh, this is the scripture. I printed it out for you to help you follow along. You'll notice that it is massive. Uh, this is the last time that I'm going to preach through a giant uh, section. Uh, from here on out, it, it's much smaller. Um, so this is going to require every bit of your attention. Um, you know, it's rare that we ever in communities read this much of Scripture together all at once. I think there's a value in it, but it will require quite a bit. This is the last time in this series that we're going to do that, okay? Do you still love me after all of this? Okay, all right, we'll see. The Vision of the Harlot City. It's about the judgment of a great prostitute. Who is the great prostitute? Revelation 17, verse 1. Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and said to me, come and I will show you what? Can you read that out loud? That's what this is all about. Who is seated on many waters, with whom the kings of the land have committed sexual immorality. Now, sexual immorality in the Bible is talking about unfaithfulness to God. And the wine of whose sexual immorality the dwellers of the land have become drunk. Okay. So now we're going to look. So that's what this vision is about, the judgment of the great prostitute. So now we're going to take a look at the three main visions, one at a time. So the first main vision, you ready? The first main vision of the three we'll look at is the vision of the great prostitute and the beast. And we're going to see two scenes. We're going to see the prostitute, the beast, and then, and then the, an angel's going to interpret who they are. Okay? Sound good? So first, the vision of the prostitute and the beast. Verse 3. And he, carried, and he the angel, carried me, John, 
away in the spirit. So these are, he's in the spirit seeing visions into the wilderness. And I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast that was full of blasphemous names, and it had seven heads and ten horns. So um, now we're going to see the woman here is described in verse 4. The woman that John sees is arrayed in purple and scarlet and adorned with gold and jewels and pearls, holding in her hands a golden cup of abominations. The word abomination uh, means to emit a foul odor. So in other words, she's stinky. She's holding stink. It stinks. And the impurities, the uncleanliness of her sexual immorality, of how she has been totally unfaithful to the will of God. Verse 5. And on her forehead was written a name of mystery. Can you read that out loud, real loud? Yeah, Babylon the Great, mother of prostitutes and of the lands of abominations. I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints and the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. Remember, the judgment is because this woman has, has murdered followers of Jesus Christ. That's why the judgment's happening. Who is this woman? Well, the whole scene is, is an allusion to Ezekiel chapter 16. I encourage you to read the whole thing, but I'm going to abbreviate it for you. In, e- in Ezekiel 16, we see, that, uh, we see the God's faithless bride, Jerusalem. So verse 2, son of man, Ezekiel, God says, make known to who? Jerusalem, her abominations. Remember, same language of and say, thus says the Lord to who? Who? So it's Jerusalem we're talking about. Okay. So next we see God's betrothal to Jerusalem. In verse 8, behold, you, Jerusalem, were at the age of love, and I, listen to this, I spread the corner of my garment over you, and I covered your nakedness. I made my vow to you and entered into a covenant with you, declares the Lord, and you became mine. Do you see what's happening? God is marrying Jerusalem. Now, what happens is Jerusalem becomes unfaithful. Verse 15, but you trusted in your beauty and played the what? The whore. At the head of every street, you built your lofty place and made your beauty an abomination, offering yourself to any passerby and multiplying your whoring. Because all, you did all these things, the deeds of a brazen prostitute, adulterous wife, Jerusalem, right? Who receives strangers instead of her husband, God, so she's faith, she's not doing the will of God, not doing the will of God. Um, so therefore, so God marries Jerusalem, she's unfaithful, and because of that horrific unfaithfulness, you need to read the details, by the way, um, then she's going to have a judgment placed on her. And this is what it says, therefore, O prostitute, who is Jerusalem, hear the word of the Lord, because of your whorings and your abomination, behold, I will gather all your lovers with whom you took pleasure, all those you loved and all those you hated, and I will gather them against you from every side. Do you see what's happening? God marries Jerusalem, she's unfaithful, so then a judgment comes and her enemies surround Jerusalem, okay? So... That is going to be important in understanding who this woman is, the prostitute. Remember, only Jerusalem is married to to Yahweh, right? She's she's married. Rome's not married to, to Yahweh. It's Jerusalem, that is. So now, in the second part, the angel reveals the mystery of the great prostitute and the scarlet beast. Verse 6, And I saw her, John says, I marveled greatly. But the angel said to me, Why do you marvel? I will tell you the mystery. Phew! Phew, thank you, Um, of the woman and the great beast with uh, seven heads and ten horns that carries her. So now he's going to reveal who the beast is, okay? We're going to spend a little time on this. The beast that you saw was and is not and is about to rise from the bottomless pit and go to destruction. This is the same beast that rises out of the bottomless pit and makes war on the two witnesses in Revelation 11. It's the same beast whose number is 666 in Revelation 13. The beast that John refers to is the Roman Empire under the reign of Nero. Verse 8. And the dwellers of the land, whose names have not been written in the book of life from the foundation of the world, will marvel to see the beast, because it was and is not and is to come. 
So the, the people dwelling, inhabiting homes in the land are going to marvel to see the beast because it was and is not and is to come. Anyone perplexed by that? L okay, let me, what is this referring to? I'm going to share my own personal view of two possibilities here. So this could be referring to the Roman army that made a siege on Jerusalem and then left. Um, uh, Gaius Gallus, who is a Roman governor of Syria, led 30,000 men against Jerusalem in 66. He led all that army right up to Jerusalem and then for whatever reason turned around and left. Josephus said for, without any reason in the world. So in other words, the beast, the inhabitants of the land see the beast come, it is, and then it's not, it left. And it is to come again, so they're marveling at this beast. So it could refer to that. But more likely, here's what I kind of think is happening here. There at that time was a widespread belief that Nero, the emperor Nero, um, who had died, was, had come back to life and was going to reappear. So again, after the death of Nero in 68 AD, there was a popular widespread belief that Nero was still alive and would shortly reappear. If you re I highly recommend this book, Nero. Um, the author basically is quoting historians from that time. The whole book is quotes of historians. And you will see the beastliness of, of Nero, and you will read the accounts of this widespread belief. So if you've ever been in the States and you've heard about Elvis Presley, you know, no one believes, you know, no, Elvis Presley's not died, hasn't died, he's somewhere still alive. That, that's nothing compared to uh, the fervor of the belief that Nero actually uh, was still alive. In fact, people would go to the other side of the Roman Empire, impersonate Nero, and get a huge following. So they marveled to see the beast because it was, and it is not, yet it is about to come. I, I think it may be referring to that. Verse 9, we'll go on. And this calls for the mind of wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman is seated. Now, Rome was known as the city uh, of seven hills. But John says this calls for a mind of wisdom. In other words, if it's as easy as seven hill mountains, that doesn't call for a mind of wisdom. It's, you know, Rome is known as that. But there are many, many cities that are known as a city of seven mountains or seven hills. In fact, Constantinople was built intentionally where it was because it had seven hills. Because all, there was many cities like this. Jerusalem was one city built on seven mountains, and you can see those mountains there. Verse 10, they are also seven kings. I see these kings as the seven Roman emperors. Five have fallen, Julius, Augustus, Tiberius, Caligula, Claudius. One is... That would be Nero. And the other has not yet come. That would be Galba. And when he does come, he must only remain only a little while. And when, by the way, when he did, he only remained seven months. As for the beast that was and is not, it is of the eight, but it belongs to the seven, and it goes to destruction. Then verse 12. And the ten horns that you saw are ten kings. Um, I believe these kings to be the ten Roman governors, a, a symbol of the ten Roman governors. Rome, the Roman Empire, was divided into ten provinces with kings or governors above each of those provinces. So that you saw are ten kings who have not yet received royal power, right? Because the only one is the emperor in Rome. But they are to receive authority as kings for one hour together with the beast. Verse 13. These are of one mind, and they, that is the ten Roman governors, the entire Roman Empire, hands over their power and authority to the beast... And they, the beast and the ten Roman governors, will make war on who? The lamb. I believe this may refer to the, Roman, the whole Roman Empire's persecution on Christianity, which Nero initiated in 64, and it, it really began in that, at that time. And the lamb will conquer them. Who does the lamb conquer? Nero and the the ten Roman governors, the whole Roman Empire. And um, in other words, the Lamb is going to defeat them. Jesus will win. And that is a fact. 
There is no Roman Empire anymore. But one out of every three human beings on the face of the planet called Jesus Christ Lord. He won. For he, Jesus, is the Lord of lords and the King of kings, and those with whom he called are and chosen and faithful. Verse 15. And the angel said to me, The waters that you saw where the prostitute, which I see as Jerusalem, is seated, are peoples and multitudes and nations and languages. And a great illustration of that would be at in Acts when they all the peoples and languages and they all came to Jerusalem because they were spread out throughout the whole Roman Empire. Um, Then verse 16, and the ten horns, which are the ten Roman governors that you saw, they, the ten Roman governors, and the beast, Rome under Nero, will hate the who? So you got the whole Roman Empire hating who? So this can't be Rome. They're not going to hate Rome and destroy Rome. It's Jerusalem here. They will make her desolate and naked and devour her flesh and burn her up with fire. And that happened. That is the destruction of Jerusalem. Remember, Jesus foretold this. He said in Luke 21, But when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then know that its desolation has come near. Verse 17, For God has put it into their, that is the ten governors, hearts to carry out his purpose by being of one mind and handing over their royal power to the beast, Nero, Rome under Nero, until the words of God are what? Remember, Jesus talked about this fulfillment of God's word in Luke 21. He says, these are days of what? Vengeance. Why are they days of vengeance? Because God is avenging the blood of the martyrs. They trusted in Jesus, and because of that, they were murdered senselessly to fulfill all that was written. They will fall by the edge of the sword and be led captive among all nations, and who? Jerusalem will be trampled underfoot by the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are what? Fulfilled. Verse 18, and the woman that you saw is what? Is the great city. So the prostitute is a metaphor for the great city that has dominion over the kings of the land. Now, the phrase, the great city, um, uh, it describes Jerusalem in Revelation. In Revelation 11, 8, the great city where the Lord was crucified. So that's Jerusalem. Again, in Revelation 16, the great city split into three parts, an allusion to Ezekiel's prophecy about the destruction, again, of Jerusalem. Again, remembering, equating the great city with Babylon the Great. Okay. So, as I see it, the woman who is the great prostitute is also the great city where Christ was crucified, who is also Babylon the Great. This is Jerusalem. This is Jerusalem. All right. So, this whole part one is a judgment on Jerusalem because of how she has murdered those who trust in Jesus. Read Acts again, and you'll see this in the the early history of the church. All right, everybody with me? So we can kind of stretch, break for a moment. Now we're going to go to the next scene. We're going to look at three visions here. Uh, In in the the judgment of the great prostitute, there's three visions. So we looked at one. Now we'll stretch, break, look at two. Ready? Now we're going to look at the fall of Babylon the Great, the harlot city. And you're going to see four scenes, the announcement of the fall, the warning to escape Jerusalem, the weeping over the fall of Jerusalem, and then the fall of Babylon itself. It's all written in powerful prophetic poetry. I wish I could spend all day just looking on this vision alone. It is filled with allusions from, about the fall of Babylon from Isaiah and, and Jeremiah. It's just incredible. Uh, but I'm going to read through this quickly um, so that we can get to to the good news here. All right. So first there's an announcement of the fall. Now we're in chapter 18, verse 1. And after this I saw another angel coming down from heaven, having great authority, and the land was made bright with his glory. Yeah. And he called out, and I'd like you to call out what the angel called out. He called out with a mighty voice. Okay, that's not a mighty voice. Okay, he called out with a mighty voice. She has become a dwelling place for demons, a haunt for every unclean spirit, a haunt for 
every unclean bird, a haunt for every unclean and detestable beast, all allusions to the prophets. For all nations have drunk the wine of the passion of her sexual immorality, her unfaithfulness to God as her husband. And the kings of the land have committed sexual immorality with her. Um, and the merchants of the land have grown rich from the power of her luxurious living. See, she has not been faithful to God's, God's call. Then there's a, the angel uh, uh, calls the people to flee Jerusalem, okay? Verse 4, then I heard another voice from heaven saying, what? Come out of her, my people, lest you take part in her sins, lest you share in her plagues, for her sins are heaped as high as heaven, and God has remembered her iniquities. Remember, Jesus called his disciples to flee Jerusalem in Luke 21. But when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then know its desolation has come. Then let those who are in Judea, what? Get out in the mountains. And let those who are inside Jerusalem, what? Flee, go, leave. He saved them by this forewarning. Verse 6, pay Jerusalem back as she herself has paid back others, and repay her double for her deeds. Mix a double portion for her in the cup she mixed. As she glorified herself and lived in, in luxury, right? So give her a, measure, a like measure of torment and mourning, since in her heart she says, you know, I sit as the queen. You know, I'm, I'm God's chosen one. I sit as a queen. I'm no widow, and, I, and mourning I shall never see. See, she was proud. This is an illusion uh, in Isaiah where uh, Babylon was saying, you know, like, I shall be a mistress forever. I shall not sit as a widow or know the loss of children. Just totally puffed up with themselves, right? And for this reason, her plagues will come in a single day, death and mourning and famine, and she will be burned up with fire, for mighty is the Lord God who has what? So God's judgment is coming because she has totally rejected God. Then there's going to be weeping over Jerusalem. Imagine if all of your businesses were in Jerusalem and all your money, all how you made money. Um, and Jerusalem was so beautiful and glorious. Um, and imagine how you would feel to see Jerusalem fall. So this whole section is just weeping. I'll go through this quickly. Verse 9, And the kings of the land who committed sexual immorality, they were unfaithful to God and lived in luxury, right, neglecting the poor with her, will weep and wail over her uh, when they see the smoke of her burning. They will stand far off in fear of her torment and say, alas, alas, you great city, you mighty city, Babylon, Jerusalem, for in a single hour your judgment has come. And then the merchants of the land weep and mourn for her since no one buys her cargo anymore. Cargo, I mean, think about all the products that were made. Gold, silver, jewelry, pearls, fine linen, purple, cloth, silk, scarlet cloth, all kinds of scented wood, all kinds of articles of ivory, all kinds of articles of costly wood, bronze, iron, and marble, cinnamon, spice, incense, myrrh, frankincense, wine, oil, fine flour, wheat, cattle and sheep, horses and chariots and slaves, that is the souls. Now, if you, it's very interesting. If you read Josephus, the Jewish wars, you'll see the booty that Titus brought back from Jerusalem to Rome, you'll see the similarities between those uh, things that were lost. By the way, the Colosseum in Rome, how was that built? By Jer the, all they brought back from Jerusalem, all the, the treasures that they brought back, that's what built the Colosseum in Rome. Built many other things as well. Verse 14, and the fruit of which the soul, your soul longed has gone from you, and all your delicacies and your splendors are lost to you, never to be found again. And then the merchants of the merchandise who gained wealth from her will stand afar in fear and torment, weeping and mourning aloud, alas, alas, for the great city. And then notice the, the description of the woman, is the, the prostitute, and the beginning is the same here. Uh, that was clothed in fine linen and purple and scarlet, adorned with gold and jewels and pearls. For in a single hour, all this wealth has been laid waste. And then there are shipmasters and seafaring men, sailors, and all whose trade is on the sea, stood far off and cried as they saw the smoke of her burning. What city is like the great city? And they threw dust on their heads and as they wept and mourned, saying, Alas, alas, great city, where all who had ships at sea grew rich by her wealth. For in a single hour she has been laid waste. 
Rejoice over her, O O heaven, and you who? And who? And prophets. For God has given judgment for who? Remember, God's avenging the blood of the believers in Jesus Christ who were murdered there against her. Jesus already predicted this in Matthew 23. Jesus pronounced seven woes. That means complete woe, finality woe, to the religious leaders, the scribes and Pharisees. Therefore, Jesus said, I'll send prophets, wise men, scribes. Some of you will kill, crucify, flog, and persecute, so that on you, scribes and Pharisees of that particular generation, may come all the righteous blood shed on the land. Wow. They're going to receive the judgment. Truly, I say to you, all these things will come upon this particular generation. Then we see the fall itself. Then a mighty angel took up a stone like a great millstone and threw it into the sea, saying, what? What does he say? So will Babylon, the great city, be thrown down with violence and will be found no more. And the sound of harpists and musicians or of flute players and trumpets will be heard in you no more. And a a craftsman of any craft will be found in you no more. And the sound of the mill will be heard in you no more. And the light of the lamp will shine in you no more. And the voice of the bridegroom and the bride will be heard in you no more. For the merchants were the great ones of the land and the nations were deceived by your sorcery because Jerusalem made pacts with all the people they did business with to say, don't sell to the, to the Christians. They persecuted the Christians at this time. And in her, Jerusalem, was found the blood of the prophets and saints and all who have been slain on the land. Jesus, remember, weeped over Jerusalem when he said in Luke 13, for it cannot be that a prophet should perish away from where? It's Jerusalem. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, that the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent in it. All right. Okay. So do you see what's happening? A picture of the prostitute, who I see as Jerusalem. Picture of the beast. We'll look at that next week. So that's vision one. Vision two is the, the fall of the great prostitute who is Jerusalem. So we see a picture of the fall of Jerusalem. All right. Stretch back, break. Now, you ready for some good news? Are you ready for some good news? I'm ready for some good news after all that. Okay, let's, here we go. This is the last and final vision here. Um, So the vision of rejoicing in heaven. For the the judgment of the prostitute, rejoicing because God reigns, and then, of course, the marriage supper, and we'll look at that. That's what we'll focus on. So the first reason for the hallelujah at the end of all this is God has judged the great prostitute. Verse 1 of chapter 19, after this I heard what seemed to be the loud voice of a great multitude in, where? Heaven. Crying out. Okay, can you cry out like like a great multitude in heaven maybe? And I'm going to ask you every highlighted word words I'm going to ask you to do like a multitude in heaven. So let me read that again after I heard what seemed to be a loud voice of a great multitude in heaven crying out, the salvation and the glory and the power belong to our God. Now, hallelujah is, means praise Yahweh. Hallelujah is praise. Yah is short for Yahweh. So it's a praise of Yahweh, all right? A praise of Yahweh. By the way, this is the only place in the New Testament where we see hallelujah. The only place in the New Testament. Hallelujah. Uh, Verse 2. Why? Why do we praise Yahweh? Because, and you're going to remember in the vision of the seven bowls, this, this was the centerpiece of the praise. Okay? And so we see it again. Verse 2. For God's judgments are true and just. For he has judged the great prostitute, it's, it's happened, who has corrupted the land with her immorality, her unfaithfulness to God's will, and has avenged on her the blood of his servants. So that's what the judgment's all about. They've murdered the peop- those who trust in Jesus. Once more, they cried out, 
the smoke of her, of her, the great prostitute, Jerusalem, goes up forever and ever. And the 24 elders and the four living creatures fell down and worshiped God who was on the throne saying, Amen. Hallelujah. Amen to that one. And from the throne came a voice saying, Praise our God, all you his servants, you who fear him, small and great. So you see what's happening. So it's finally finished, and the judgment is complete. You're, this is, we're not going to see this judgment anymore from here on out uh, of the great prostitute. So it's finally finished, and they praise God for, for um, coming through. Imagine, imagine seeing all your Christian friends just murdered, 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 murdered. God, where are you? Where are you? Are you really just? Are you really going to do what's right? And finally he does, and so they praise him for it. Then, then Jesus connects his reign with that moment, and so the second reason for the hallelujah is God reigns. Verse 6, then I heard what seemed to be the voice of a great multitude, like the roar of many waters, the voice of Christ, like the sound of the mighty peals of thunder, remember Revelation 4 from the throne, uh, crying out, for the Lord God Almighty reigns. Where have we heard that? Where have we heard those words before? This is where the hallelujah, the other part of the hallelujah chorus, hallelujah. His reign has come. Remember, Jesus said to his disciples uh, in, in all three uh, synoptic gospels, you'll see it on the screen, he says, some of you standing here will not die, will not taste death until you disciples see what? See the Son of Man coming into his kingdom, see the kingdom of God after it has come with power, and see the kingdom of God. That is what's being celebrated. The kingdom of Christ has come. The kingdom has come. All right. Then the final reason for the hallelujah, the best news of all, the marriage supper of the Lamb. So they, they verse 7, let us rejoice and exalt and give him the glory. Why? Well, yeah. Why rejoice and be glad? Because the marriage of the Lamb, who's the Lamb? Jesus, right? Has come, and his bride has made herself ready. Verse 8, and it was granted her to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure. Again, a, if you remember, this, this comes from Ezekiel. We read this earlier. God married Jerusalem. And when you get married, you dress, you, know, you dress up. So God says to Jerusalem, I clothed you with embroidered cloth. I wrapped you with fine linen. I covered you with rich fabric. Because she's getting married. So the lamb is getting married. To who, right? To who? So then in verse 8, it says, For the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. So the marriage is a metaphor, but these are righteous deeds. So this is straight out of Isaiah 61. Uh, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall exult in my God. Doesn't that language sound similar to what we just read? For God has clothed me with garments of what? He has saved me. He has covered me with robes of righteousness, his own righteousness. He's clothed me in his own righteousness. Um, as a bridegroom decks himself like a priest with a beautiful headdress, and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels. And then finally, the angel gives a beatitude because the marriage of the lamb has come, so there's a blessing that is pronounced. The angel said to me, write this, blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the lamb. And then he said to me, these are the true words of God. Then I, John, fell down at, at the angel's feet to worship the angel. But the angel said to me, you must not do that. I am a fellow servant with you and your brothers who hold to the testimony of Jesus. Worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Amen. 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 That's it. That's the last time we're going to go through that much text. That is the word of the Lord for us today. The word of the Lord. I want to just spend a little time now looking at the marriage supper of the Lamb. 
and ha have that lead us into a special communion. You ready? So we're just going to look now at the marriage supper of the Lamb so that we come into this time of communion. So you're going to see the marriage supper of the Lamb reflected in communion. Hallelujah. The marriage of the Lamb has come. Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. Why blessed? Why are you blessed? Well, let me talk about the marriage feast. Throughout the Old Testament, the coming of God's kingdom is described with a metaphor. What is that metaphor? A great marriage feast. That's the coming of God's kingdom is described like a great marriage feast. It, in, in the Old Testament, Isaiah 25, on the mountain, God makes a feast for all people. That is what's called, technical, theologically, technically, the great messianic marriage banquet at the end of the age. In other words, it's the time when uh, the messianic age is ushered in, that the kingdom of God and the, the Messiah's reign begins. Does that make sense? So it's described as a marriage, and that's when the Messiah, who is Jesus, begins that reign. Okay. So the angel pronounces a blessing. Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb because the angel is announcing the coming of God's kingdom. That's why the angel says, Rejoice! Exalt, be glad, dance, jump up and down, for the marriage of, of the Lamb has come. Jesus himself describes the kingdom, God's kingdom, as a wedding feast. In the parable of the wedding feast in Matthew 22, Jesus says, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king, who is God, Yahweh, who gave a wedding feast for his son. Who's the son? Yes. Jesus, the kingdom of heaven, Jesus says, is like God throwing a big, giant, huge wedding party for his son, Jesus, because Jesus is getting married. It's good news, you guys. Okay. Jesus can, when Jesus talked about this coming of the son of man, he said, no one is going to know the day or the hour. And he connects that coming by saying, be ready. It's going to be like a big, giant wedding feast. He uses the metaphor of a wedding to describe this time. Remember, in the parable of the ten virgins in Matthew 25, Jesus says, again, the kingdom of heaven. What's it going to be like? Well, it'll be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Five were foolish, five were wise. As the bridegroom was delayed, they all became sleepy and drowsy. But at midnight, there was a cry. What was the cry? Yeah, the bride, so it's midnight. The bridegroom comes. Here is the bridegroom. Come out to meet him. Bridegroom here is Jesus. And the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went in with, in with him to the marriage feast. Watch, therefore, that you know neither the day nor the hour. So Jesus, describing the coming of the Son of Man like a bride being ready for her bridegroom. Jesus is the bridegroom. Those who are ready are invited to the wedding feast. They're invited to be married to Jesus. Hallelujah. Can you say that with me? Hallelujah. For the Lord God Almighty reigns. Let's rejoice and be glad for the marriage of the Lamb has come. Jesus is getting married. To who? Yes. Yes. Jesus is getting married to the church. So you've got the judgment on the great prostitute. And at that time, Jesus comes and gets married to the church. The kingdom comes. The reign of Christ comes. Jesus then becomes married to the church. Hallelujah. The marriage of the Lamb has come. We are called to be his bride. Do you know in the Old Testament, God is the father and Israel is the wife. In the New Testament, Jesus takes on, I mean, Revelation has 
the highest view of who Jesus Christ is in all the New Testament. You, you, there is nothing like it. You, when th- this whole metaphor essentially equates Jesus with God because Jesus is now the husband. Wow. L- let me give you three just verses from the Old Testament that describe this husband-wife relationship and then a couple few from the New Testament. So Isaiah 54, for your maker, God, is your husband. Verse 6, for the Lord has called you like a what? A wife. Jeremiah 2, go and proclaim in the hearing of Jerusalem, thus says the Lord, I remember the devotion of your youth, your love as a a bride to God. She was married to God. And then Ezekiel, we read this, but it's worth repeating. Ezekiel 16, 8, behold, Jerusalem, you were at the age of love, God says, and God says, I spread the corner of my garment over you and covered your nakedness. I made my vow to you and entered into a covenant with you, declares the Lord God, and you became my wife. Do you see that? So that imagery now is in the New Testament. We see it again and again. Let me give you three examples. John the Baptist says, the one who has the bride, that is Jesus, is the bridegroom. Jesus is the bridegroom. The friend of the bridegroom is John the Baptist, who stands and hears him rejoices greatly at the bridegroom's voice. So, uh, well, we'll get to that. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 11, For I, Paul, feel a divine jealousy for you, the Corinthian church, since I, as your father, betrothed you to one husband, Jesus Christ, to present you as a pure virgin to Christ. Paul later says in Ephesians, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he, Jesus, might make the church holy, having cleansed the church, right, through his blood, and by the washing of the water of the word, the gospel of Jesus, so that he, Jesus, might present the church to himself in splendor. He makes the church clean and beautiful and radiant, and he presents the church to himself without spot or wrinkle or any such thing that she might be holy and without blemish. That's why we sing the the lyrics of the song, the church's one foundation is Jesus Christ, her Lord. She is his new creation by water and the word. From heaven, he came and sought her to be his holy bride. With his own blood, he bought her. He paid the price with his own blood. And for her life, he died. Israel is the bride of Yahweh. The church is the bride of Christ. We are the bride of the Lamb. Wow. Now, let me close by sharing with you um, first century Jewish marriage customs. And that will help us understand what's happening in communion. So is that a picture of the marriage supper? You got a picture of that? Now I'm going to share the customs, and it'll help you understand what's actually happening in communion. In the Jewish marital customs in the first century, there were really three main stages to getting married. The first stage was what was called the contract. So the, the groom would go over to the bride's house, talk to the bride's father, and basically negotiate a purchase price to, to, to pay. Okay, oh, there's some laughter out there. Um, and then after the groom and the father agreed on a purchase price, then the groom would take a cup. By the way, this is how I asked my wife to marry me through this tradition. This cup you're seeing, I asked her mom to carve this cup. So I asked her mom's blessing, and I asked her to carve it. So this is my mother-in-law carved this cup for me. This is the cup that I asked my wife to marry me with. This, is, this custom is from, the, I did it because of this custom. So the groom then takes a cup, fills the cup with wine, and then after the purchase price has been agreed upon, he hasn't paid the price yet, but they've agreed on it, then the, the husband, uh, the groom comes and gives the cup of wine And if she takes it and drinks it, she says, yes, I will take your life into me. Do you see that? 
So the betrothal is an agreement on the price. Then there's a ceremony with the words, this is a cup of a new covenant, right, between us, a new promise. At that point, they are legally married. They're not just kind of like our engagements today. I mean, they are married. They have not consummated the, 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 the marriage. And that can last for up to one whole year because they need to make preparations. So after the yes from the woman, then the groom goes back to his father's house and he prepares a room at his father's house. And, and then once he's prepared everything, once they've already prepared the whole feast, because it was a big deal, took a lot of money, a lot of time, once everything was ready, a home was prepared, a feast was ready, then the groom would go back to the bride's house. She didn't know when. Often he would surprise her at midnight, see if she's ready, if her lamp was lit, okay? And so the groom goes along with his whole entourage, his best friend and the wedding party, and they would go over to the bride's house, and that's where the groom, that's where they would call out, the bridegroom's here. Are you ready? It's midnight. So she gets up. She's either ready or she's not. She gets up, and he goes into the room um, at the bride's house, at the bride's mother's house, with all the wedding party right outside the door. No pressure, by the way. And he, the language of the Bible is takes, takes his wife. That's the consummation, okay? And as soon as that happens, then um, you know, that's why John the Baptist says he delights in hearing the voice of the bridegroom because what John is saying is the bridegroom has consummated the marriage. As soon as that happens, they go out from their, his mother-in-law's house and they march to his father's home and have the greatest party of their lives, the great wedding feast. So now do you see what's happening in communion? It's a marriage feast. And this leads us to our special communion. It was on the night that Jesus was betrayed that he gave thanks and for the bread and broke the bread, gave it to his disciples saying, Take this and eat this. This is my body given for you. Do it in remembrance of me. And then he takes the cup of the new covenant, sealed in his blood, shed for the forgiveness of all of your sins. When you drink of this, do it in remembrance of me. When you eat the bread, drink the cup, you're preaching his saving death until he comes again. Do you see what's going on? Jesus is giving the cup to you, his bride, and saying, will you marry me? Will you marry me? It's the betrothal. The purchase price was already agreed upon, but he's asking his bride to marry them. He's going to then later, in fact, that next day, pay the purchase price, which is his whole life. And then if you remember in John 14, Jesus says, you know, don't be afraid, don't be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me, for in my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you that I go and prepare a place for you. He's getting married to you. And if I go and prepare a place in my Father's house, I will come again and I will take you to myself, consummate the marriage, that where I am, you may also be. Today we're doing a special communion. We're going to do it in a different way, like we do in the third service. And we're going to have communion servers stationed here and here, there and there, and uh, ushers that are going to usher you each out of, the, out of your pew. We're going to stand and come as an act of saying, I do. Um, so you'll come out of your pew, you'll get the bread you can eat that on your own, but you can hold on to the juice and we'll take that together. And then you'll go back to your seat by circling around and going in the other side of the pew. Um, I hope and pray that this will be um, received like a wedding feast. Um, 
an opportunity for you to stand. And if you're not able to stand or if there's someone who has a disability, please notice them and, and get the elements for them and serve them where they are. But may this be a time where you can hear Jesus say, I want to marry you. I want to marry you. So Heavenly Father, we pray that this time would be so rich where we can come and we can say, I do. I do. In Jesus' name, amen.